On behalf of the National Eczema Association, I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar Wednesday presentation, Biologics for Eczema by Dr. Peter Leo. I'm your host, Danny Morsehead, Marketing and Communications Manager here at the National Eczema Association. And our presenter today is Dr. Peter Leo, MD. Dr. Leo is a board certified dermatologist and a fellow of the American Academy of Dermatology. He's assistant professor of clinical dermatology and pediatrics dermatology at Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine and founding director of Chicago Integrative Eczema Center. Dr. Leo also serves on NIA's Scientific and Medical Advisory Council and NIA's Board of Directors. And with that, I'm pleased to introduce our presenter, Dr. Peter Leo. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me. Thanks to all of you for tuning in. I'm very excited to talk about some exciting changes that we have in the world of atopic dermatitis therapy. And we're really gonna delve deep into the biologics. What are they, what do they do, and who are they for? And we will have plenty of time at the end to ask to do questions. If you guys have any questions or thoughts, I'd be more than happy to, to delve into those. So let's begin a little bit with, um, we're gonna talk about sort of the, the framework. These are my disclosures. I have worked with a number of different companies who are focused on atopic dermatitis. This is all in the last few years because before then we really didn't have a lot of activity, but I'm happy to say now lots of companies are interested in the space. So I'm working with them hopefully to try to give the perspective of what are some of the unmet needs. And I think you're going to hear about some of the fruits of those connections tonight. So a little bit of framework, of course, we know atopic dermatitis is really complicated. And we've been trying a very long time to understand it. But I've lived through this exciting phase in medicine. When I started focusing on atopic dermatitis more than a decade ago, there was very little known. And we sort of just had these broad strokes that we knew there was this itch scratch cycle. We knew that the immune system was acting crazy, right? There was too much inflammation in the body. We definitely knew that patients with atopic dermatitis were more prone to infection. So all of these pieces made it very confusing as to where did it all begin? And I'm happy to say we've now been able to fill in some blanks. I still don't think we understand it as fully as I'd like to. A lot of my patients ask me, what is the root cause? Like, what's the one thing? And the truth is that for most patients, we can't really give them that answer yet. Uh, for some patients, we can. You know, we have found out that for some people at least, and it depends a little bit on the population you're studying, but it could be as high as 50 or 60%. We know that there are some important breaks in the skin barrier. And some people are born with a mutation in a gene called FLG. FLG gene encodes for a protein called filaggrin. This protein plays a role in skin structure. It keeps the skin barrier nice and strong. And then when it breaks down, it actually becomes something called natural moisturizing factor. So it keeps water in your skin. And a lot of people with eczema, it turns out, are born with a problem with that gene. So for some people at least, we can say, finally, after many, many, many decades or really hundreds of years of work, people trying to figure out what's going on here, we can say, okay, the reason you have atopic dermatitis is that you have this mutation in a gene called FLG. You're not making enough filaggrin. When you don't make enough filaggrin, your skin gets dried out and leaky. I call it leaky skin. And allergens, irritants, bacteria, other things can get in there and then start this cycle. But even for people that don't start with that, that underlying mutation, and there probably are other mutations we don't know about yet, we still know that no matter where you start, the next step is gonna be that there's inflammation that is released. And we know that this happens in part because there is some itchiness when you lose water from the skin, even as little as 10% of your water in the skin, it becomes itchy. So when we feel itchy, we scratch at it, that scratching makes the inflammation start, but we also know that these irritants and allergens are getting in. We also know that the microbiome, the healthy bacteria on the skin starts getting all wonky when the skin barrier is damaged too. So everything starts falling out and they, go into this vicious cycle, this terrible, terrible feedback loop where there's more inflammation and more itch and more scratching and more rubbing and more skin barrier damage and more, all these pieces are falling apart. So as this cycle starts, no matter where you are at the beginning, 
everything is involved at some point. It's kind of like dominoes falling. You can start them at any point if you had a, a circle of dominoes. No matter where you started, it's going to all bring everybody down. So at the center of this maelstrom of activity, there are two really important cytokines that we get talked about a lot, and those are called IL-4 and IL-13. Cytokines we know are the little messengers that cells are sending to each other. And what is the message of IL-4 and IL-13? Well, at least in part, it is inflammation, itch, and skin barrier damage. There are other ones that are out there too. IL-33, IL-25, this one called TSLP, thymic stromal lymphopoietin, IL-31, some people call this the master itch cytokine. When these are released by our immune cells, and some of these are actually released by the skin cells themselves, the keratinocytes, these drive more inflammation. They tell the body, come on, more inflammation, more itch. They even directly talk to the nerve endings. The nerves actually have receptors for these and for some of these, and they will actually trigger the sensation of itch. So this is kind of what's going on. And we're finally learning about it. And we have an approach to trying to get this under control. And you will see that it is really complicated. You know, some diseases have sort of one thing. I mean, if you look at the protocol for treating strep throat infection, right? It's pretty straightforward. It's like, make sure it's strep throat, do a rapid strep test or do a culture. Okay. It's strep bacteria in the throat, antibiotic, bam, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. What a simple thing. It's a, it's a, not even a page long, you know, it's a couple lines is all you need to know how to treat it. Obviously it doesn't always work out and there can be reasons why treatment failed. You know, maybe it's a resistant bacteria, maybe it's something going on that's different, but look at the setup for atopic dermatitis for eczema. It is not that simple. It is super complicated. We have all of these pieces of the puzzle. And I think it's in part because it's such a complex group of things happening. Again, no matter where you start, no matter what the primary insult was, and sometimes maybe even whatever started this whole process, maybe it was some kind of an allergic reaction at, at first. That could be long gone, but the damage is done. The cycle has started and now we're stuck in this loop. So you can see by this is part of the guidelines. This is the European guidelines. And they're really nice because they're a little bit more current than our American guidelines, which are currently being updated. But these kind of show us the different kind of layers. We'd start by doing some basic education, what it is, what it isn't. Hey, you know, it's not it's not a contagious disease. That's important. Sometimes patients are really afraid. It's not fungal infection. Sometimes people say, gosh, you know, could this be ringworm? Should I be treating for ringworm? You know, uh, so we want to make sure we have good education. We want to use good moisturizers to try to help the skin barrier, and we want to avoid any allergens or irritants, things that can trigger it. So for some patients, I, actually, I would argue for a lot of patients, for mild patients, that might be all they need. You know, there's a whole group of patients in the world who, if they do those things, they're like, oh, I'm okay. Yeah, I don't, I actually don't need anything more. And my dream as a clinician actually is that would work for everybody. That'd be great. Like, I mean, it's a really hard condition to treat. So it'd be wonderful if that's all we needed. So we always try to start there. And if that's enough, amen, we don't have to do anymore. And ideally you'd never make it to a dermatologist if that's all you needed, but maybe you would. Sometimes I see real mild patients or I'll see a sibling of a patient who's maybe more severe. And I'll say, let's just do these basic things. Let's kind of protect the skin, avoid anything that's irritating. Maybe we'll do the allergy testing to try to actually find any allergens that could be acting as triggers and do some good education, perfect. What if that's not enough though, right? So for my life, almost like say, almost nobody's like that. They don't come to me if they're like that. So let's say they're they're doing those things and ideally everybody should be doing those things no matter how severe they are because those are important. But if that's not enough, then we might say, okay, can we use a reactive treatment? So we might treat with either a topical cortisone or a non-cortisone. We have some newer, thankfully, finally some newer non-cortisone agents that we can use to kind of just cool down a flare up. And some patients just have to do that once in a blue moon and they're great. Perfect. You know, if you use a little bit of one of these creams here and there, a few days, once in a while, I feel like your risks are pretty low. The risk benefit analysis is really favorable. It's like, we're good. But what if that's not enough? And pretty much all of my patients nowadays are starting at least at that point that they've tried the first two steps and nothing's really working. How can things fail with treatment? Well, there are three kind of hurdles I talk about with getting atopic dermatitis better. The first one is, can I get you clear in the first place? And that might be the patient who says, you know, I'm putting on the cortisone, like they said, but it's not really going away. You know, it's, it's a little better maybe, but it's not clear. So that is the first hurdle. Can I clear things up, cool the inflammation down, calm the itch down, get the skin barrier healing? 
The truth is I can do that most of the time. The vast majority of time I can clear the first hurdle. It's pretty low. I can get you better. The next hurdle though is where things get really tricky. Can I keep you clear safely? And that's where we get into all sorts of problems because I might be able to get things cleared up. Let's say I'm using a topical steroid. Fine, it's pretty safe, we think, for a short burst, but I don't want you to keep having to use it over and over and over for super long periods of time without a break. And that's what I get a lot of patients say, Doc, you know, they said, use the steroid when I need it, but I always need it. So I only had like one day off last month and it was terrible. I was a cheek. And so I'm putting it on over and over and over and over and over for months. And it's like, oof, that's not good. We, that's not safe. And then the last piece is, can you keep it up? And that's tough too, because sometimes I have these complex regimens and they really help and they're safe but the patient or the family is like we're exhausted like we feel like we spend so much time and so much energy on the skin we're just we're really falling apart like there's just so many steps and every day we have to deal with it and if we don't deal with it then things go crazy so they're having trouble maintaining and that's common and there are other reasons why people might have trouble keeping it up maybe it's cost maybe it's cost of time too you know just just i we don't have time we have to travel so on and so forth so the most exciting thing is that in the past several years, we have begun to identify different targets that are these pathways of sending the signals to keep this process going. And there are finally our medicines that can actually block some of these signals. And this is kind of an overview, and we're gonna just talk about some of these in more detail, but they kind of are laying out this pathway and saying, okay, what can we do to block IL-4 and IL-13? What can we do to block IL-5? What can we do to block IL-22? How can we block these? And different companies take you know, their best shot at trying to make a good medicine that can block it. And that is really, really, really hard. And it is a, honestly, it's a billions of dollar investment, which is why, you know, sometimes people are like, oh, the drug companies are greedy. I mean, they may or may not be. Um, but the point is, they're the only ones who are really pushing medicine forward. You know, for example, the National Institutes for Health, they don't do any drug development. Our government doesn't do it. It's really risky. And a lot of medicines get close to the end and fail and way more don't even make it past the first couple of stages. You know, they find out it, it seemed it was a good idea, but it doesn't work in practice or it works, but it's super dangerous, you know. So it, it ends up being this really tough minefield to develop medicines. Uh, and it's, it's pretty exciting when you hear about it, like the stories are awesome, but to live it, you know, it's kind of like a crazy motorcycle ride. Like it's cool to watch it on the YouTube video, but I don't know if I'd want to be on the motorcycle when we're saying, are we going to survive this death defying jump? So when I was a medical student many years ago, we discussed a lot of drug design. So this idea that we could use organic chemistry to synthesize drugs that would do what we need them to do. They would target, you know, pick these targets, they would bind to them appropriately, they, would, they wouldn't cause collateral damage. But it turns out it was kind of a lie. Like it's super, super, super hard. It's very difficult to synthesize the drugs correctly. There's so many other factors that go in on that are going on in the body that they often have these crazy, unpredictable side effects. And the cost of doing these tests, you know, because you have to first show that it works, like you know, in in a tit, in a petri dish or in a you know in a little pipette tube. But then you have to bring it up to different animals and then people, and it just it gets lost in translation. So this has been it's an exciting concept, but it really, I would say, at least in dermatology, it's been a relative failure. We don't see a ton of new drugs developed, at least the way it was told to me 25 years ago. Um, but the big breakthrough came with the concept that we could ask Mother Nature for her wisdom, right? Mother Nature is a lot smarter than we are. So the idea is that we have antibodies in our body that are doing tons of stuff in our body. In particular, they're designed to find infections and bind to them. But because there's so many different things that could infect us, our body has developed ways to make tons and tons and tons, as you'll hear about in a minute, of antibodies. And people said, well, maybe Mother Nature could solve this problem of making something specific. So this is really what we mean in general when we talk about biologics, antibodies that are raised to target a particular uh, part of the part of the the messaging system in the body now it's a little bit bigger than that because the biologics technically refers to things that are made more made if synthesized rather made rather than synthesized by by a living organism so one of the first ones that came out was human recombinant insulin it was in 1982 and then people realized that there was some real success for these antibodies as well and these included 
incredible life altering therapies for things like cancer, genetic diseases, and tons of immune disorders. For example, in, in arthritis and rheumatoid arthritis, there's dozens of different biologics. So we're going to focus on the part of biologics called monoclonal antibodies. So Mother Nature has found an amazing way to take this concept of a protein that has an area that it does not change. That's kind of the part in the solid color here, the white color. And then these areas that are easy to change and modify, they're kind of like able to, to meet, be any kind of a key to fit in any kind of a lock. And what they're doing is they're changing so that they can bind to different antigens. Antigen is just literally the name of the thing that it's binding to. So that could be part of bacteria. It could be part of fungus. It could be something in our bloodstream that it wants to remove. So we have all these different potentials and what's amazing is our body makes on the order of 10 billion, there's 10 billion of them running through our blood at any given time. There's a lot of antibodies and they change over time. And what's really cool is they can bind to things. And then what they can do is they can actually allow the kind of tagging them for the immune system to sort of take out of commission. And the way we use them a lot in, in our medicines here is they bind to those receptors and then the message can't get to it, which is kind of amazing. What's also great is because they're just a protein and your body knows exactly what to do with them, they sort of just break down normally over time and they do their thing. So they're a little bit different than a synthetic drug molecule uh, for the most part. Now, that doesn't mean that they're perfectly safe or perfectly natural. I don't want to overplay them, but it's pretty exciting. And what's really neat is you can actually raise an antibody to very specific targets. And by doing that, we can get around all these complex things of trying to synthesize a drug. So let's go back to that, that slide we saw where we really are looking at all these different targets. Well, the good news is we know what IL-13 looks like and what its receptor looks like, where it binds, you know, so the cell sends IL-13 and then it binds to the other cell saying, okay, here's the message. And it makes sense then that we could block either the IL-13 itself or the receptor. We know what IL-5 looks like. We know what IL-31 looks like. So all these, you can potentially raise an antibody to and then block the signal so that the message of more inflammation, more itch, skin damage gets blocked. And that's really what we're doing here with the power of antibodies. So how many do we have in dermatology right now? Well, we have a lot in dermatology as a whole because psoriasis is like 10 or 15 years ahead of atopic dermatitis. So there are, there's got to be at least, you know, eight or 10 of them in psoriasis. But for atopic dermatitis, we really only have one so far. And we're really eager to have more because while it's a very good medicine, it's nice to have some competition and it's nice to have some selection because obviously one size does not fit all. But dupilumab is the first one. And let's talk just for a second about the name. The MAB actually refers to monoclonal antibody. That's what we've been talking about. Monoclonal means it's all the same one. They're the same type. And the U in front of it, so UMAB, means that it's fully human. Because there are other ways to make these. You can actually use like mice antibodies. You can raise it in a mouse and then you can kind of fix it a little bit. Because if you just put mice antibodies in our body, other antibodies will say, wait a minute, this isn't one of ours. And they'll actually start attacking the antibodies. Now that can even happen to human ones, but it's much less likely. So it's Dupil UMAB, a fully human monoclonal antibody. That's what the name means. And indeed, this is a fully human monoclonal antibody, and it binds to this thing called the IL-4 receptor alpha. That's one of the receptors that's used both in IL-4 signaling and IL-13. So when those messages come through, those little, little they're called the cytokines, right? They come through. If the dupilumab is blocking it, it can't get to IL-4, and IL-13 can't get to its receptor either because that's shared by both of them. It was originally approved in 2017 for adults, but as we know, in 2020, it actually got its its most recent approval down to six-year-olds uh, and up, and it's for moderate, severe, uncontrolled atopic dermatitis. So who is it for? It's definitely not for everybody. It is really for patients who have to be at least six years of age, and they really have to be more moderate or severe, and they have to have tried some topicals. They have to be uncontrolled by definition, uh, and it is injected every two or four weeks, depending on the weight. For the littlest patients, it's actually every four weeks, and it's done usually at home by the patient, and it's, um, it's like a little syringe or a little pen. So that is not the only 
biologic that we're excited about in atopic dermatitis. Although that one, like I say, came out in 2017. So here's dupilumab and it's blocking the IL-4 receptor alpha. So this means that IL-4 can't bind and then IL-13 also uses that one as well. So it's interfering with both IL-4 and IL-13, kind of killing two birds with one stone. There are two other ones that I know about that are in development in the similar pathway, and that's lebrachizumab and trelokinumab. And again, you'll see they're both UMABs, human monoclonal antibodies. And these guys are similar, but they're a little bit different. Unlike dupilumab, which binds to the receptor, right? It actually binds to that part. These guys actually bind to the cytokine itself. So in the blood, they actually just go find it and bind to it, which then blocks it from binding to its receptor. So both lebrachizumab and trelokinumab bind to the IL-13 only. And this suggests that they really only block IL-13 signaling and do not block IL-4 signaling, whereas dupilumab blocks both. What does that mean clinically? We don't know yet. We really don't. My guess is from what we've seen so far of the data that's out is that they'll actually all be fairly similar, both in terms of safety and efficacy. But I'm kind of hoping they'll be a little bit different because, for example, some patients, dupilumab is not the right fit. Either it didn't help them as much as I hoped or they had some issues with it. So I'm hoping that they'll be different enough that we could then try one of these other ones. But I honestly truly don't know yet. And I think that's one of those things we're just not going to get an answer until they're out. And I have some of my patients who are eager to go back on a biologic, but they can't use dupilumab for whatever reason. So that would be really exciting to see what happens. Well, how good can a biologic be? And in particular, how good is dupilumab? Well, there was this wonderful paper just about a year ago where they were comparing some of the different treatments in atopic dermatitis. And they look at this thing called the MADAD, the meta-analysis derived AD transcriptomes. This kind of looks at sort of how good a medicine is it's sort of blocking a lot of the different proteins and you know the gene activity that results in proteins of inflammation that are seen in atopic dermatitis so it's kind of a very objective way to look at this outside of the patients outside of you know how they're feeling or anything it's really like what's happening on a molecular level and it turns out that cyclosporin is really among the best and that's a powerful conventional immunosuppressant that we still use to this very day but dupilumab was really close right behind and it was actually much more targeted and then we see like our topical steroids like triamcinolone are not not far behind that and these guys kind of beat everything else out so for what it's worth you know sometimes people say why do they use that you know why are they obsessed with fill in the blank this is kind of why, because they work really well and they really, you know, reliably can help patients. Um, but they, you know, everything has trade-offs, of course. So what about dupilumab's trade-off? Does it have anything? Is it perfect? Mm, definitely not. It definitely seems safer than our conventional immunosuppressants like cyclosporin. It's way safer than prednisone. It's way safer than methotrexate. All those kind of older medicines that we still, unfortunately, sometimes have to use. We try to avoid them when we can. But there are some issues. About 10% of patients will develop this conjunctivitis, itchy red eyes. Usually it's mild. Usually they're able to get through it. And in fact, when I send those patients to ophthalmology before people knew about it, they were just like, oh, it's just like allergic I, you know, allergic eye stuff, it's seasonal or something. And I was like, mm, I don't think so. I think it's from the medicine, um, but it can be hard to treat. In some patients, it's bad enough that I've had to stop it. So while not necessarily dangerous, it can be very unpleasant and we want to keep an eye on that. It can also cause injection site reactions where people do the shot, they can get pain, they can get redness, swelling, it can be very uncomfortable. They also rarely could be actually allergic to it and have a systemic reaction, which is scary. It's pretty rare, less than 1% were seen in the trials, but it can happen. I tell my patients, you know, we have to be on the lookout for that like any medicine. It's also extremely expensive. As you can imagine, these medicines are very, very pricey, usually covered by insurance. But if you don't have good insurance or if the insurance has a gap, you know, these are tens of thousands of dollars per year. And the fact that it's a shot makes it very uncomfortable, especially for kids. A lot of kids are like, I don't want a shot. This is scary. Every couple of weeks I have to get a shot. In the six to 12 year old age group, it was actually pretty comparable to what was seen in the older age groups. There were uh, really nothing, no other scary signals that we saw, but a few other things were seen. Things like upper respiratory tract infection seen a little bit higher. Um, uh, we also saw some vomiting, cough, and headache. Um, there's also the reactivation of cold sores. People that have had cold sores, they can get them again. But generally speaking, pretty safe. And what I like about it is that 
there's no blood work that has to be done. So that's really nice. There's nothing mandated or even recommended, which is great. Sometimes patients say, shouldn't we check something? And you know, I said, we can, but I, the thing is, it doesn't seem to do anything that we're going to, you know, be able to follow um, beyond, you know, routine stuff. So it's really good that that, that has been very helpful. And in my own hands, it probably has helped about 75% of my patients who needed it. And my patients tend to be a little bit more severe. So I think that's been awesome. It's been one of the things I always joke about is that I've gotten more fruit baskets and thank you notes and, you know, really warm letters of thanks because this has made a big difference for a lot of people. So I'm grateful for it, but that's not hundred percent, right? That's 75%. So that means at least a quarter of my patients are not where they need to be with it. Why? Well, there are a number of reasons. For some, it just didn't help them as much as others or didn't help them at all. For others, they had a side effect. Typically, the most common thing I've seen is the conjunctivitis. We've also seen some other side effects that can happen. Some people kind of get this face and neck irritation, comes out of nowhere sometimes, it's very odd. So we've tried to work on that. Sometimes I can get them better, other times I can't. And I say, it's time, we've just got to stop it. Uh, some patients, they just don't like the way they feel on it. So there are many things that potentially could happen. And for those patients, you know, we really have to see what else is out there. Now, we wrote a paper, Vivian Shi and Alexi Hendricks and I wrote this paper just a year and a half ago or so about what we could do for patients that are on dupilumab, but maybe it's still not enough. They're like, ugh, I'm better, but I'm still kind of miserable. I'm still having itch. And we talked about kind of thinking about maybe what's going on. So these additional diagnoses, could there be something else happening? And this would include everything from, could there be allergic, you know, allergic contact dermatitis going on? I've seen that in a number of my patients. And once we figure out what the heck is making them allergic, we remove that, they do much better. Could it, could it be a drug reaction to another medicine they're taking? Could it be cutaneous T cell lymphoma? Could they also have infection? You know, so all these different things. So we kind of talked about it. And then we kind of gave some ideas of things that people could try everything from just increasing the topicals, doing things like wet wraps, to also potentially even adding another medicine to help cool things down, but typically at a low dose. Because, you know, we talked about some of those other medicines that have a lot of side effects, these um, immunosuppressants. We don't really want to use them ever, but particularly during the pandemic, I didn't want to use them. But some patients, we can use just the tiniest, tiniest little dose. And we know with those, it's very much the trade offs are pretty clean. You know, the stronger the dose, the better it works, but the higher the side effects. So you trade effect for risk. Whereas if you use those low dose, usually the risks are very minimal. And in a long side of something like dupilumab, it actually has been pretty helpful. Of course, it's technically not on label for this. The FDA has not approved any of these things to be used together. But as far as we understand, it seems to be okay. Here's the best part. This is the most exciting part now. So we, we really had some new, new ideas in dermatology for the first time. But the best part is that's the tip of the spear. There are so many things coming. We have all these different drugs in development, and many of them actually are biologics. So we talked about trilokinumab and lembrokizumab. They're coming. There's one for TSLP, that other one we talked about. And this one is another UMAB, so a human monoclonal antibody. There's one against IL-31 which we said is the master itch cytokine. So it actually binds to the IL-31 receptor. It's called nemolizumab. So that's kind of exciting. And then there are even others. So I wanted to just look at a couple that we know more about that are coming out soon. We think, we hope, <laughs> if all goes well. That's the other problem with making medicines. You can get really, really, really far. And then at the last minute, there could be a problem. And they say, yeah, no, we're not going to approve it. So it makes us all nervous because Obviously, for me, I just want more stuff to be able to, to talk to my patients about, have more options, especially for patients who failed things like dupilumab. So I'm kind of waiting with bated breath. I'm really hoping we're going to have some new options. So let's talk about lebrokizumab. We've mentioned it a few times. This is one of the biologic agents that binds to IL-13. And there's some evidence out already, which is pretty neat. This is from the phase two randomized control trial. 280 adults with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis, and they actually show a really nice improvement in these patients. So I think maybe this is the best one for us to look at tonight, the easy 75. So 75% or better improvement in this score of their eczema, the eczema area and severity index. Easy 75 to me as a clinician is kind of like, you're a lot better. You're feeling a lot better. So we can see 
about 60% of the patients got that. And again, before they were on this medicine, they were by definition pretty miserable. They were moderate to severe, uncontrolled using their topical stuff. Um, so that's kind of pretty awesome. More than half the patients got a lot better. And when we use a little bit of a lower bar, the easy 50, so kind of 50% improvement, 81% of the patients got that. So I would say this is, this is better, you know, so almost everybody got better. 80% got better, and then 60% of the group got way better. And then the easy 90, 90% clear is still pretty impressive too, 44%. So a lot of people were essentially clear. Now, another one we mentioned before is trelokinumab, and this is another anti-IL-13, a little bit different than Lebri, but very similar. And this is a phase 2B randomized trial in 204 adults. And what they found, again, is that at week 12, when we look at that easy 50 score, uh, so 50% better, over 70% of patients hit it in the, in the major group there. So very cool. When we look at the easy 75, again, a pretty good group, almost 40% of the patients got it. Now, we're, it's always tempting to kind of compare and say, oh, wasn't the last one better or which one's better? But the truth is it's difficult to compare across trials because sometimes the placebo group's a little bit different. Sometimes some of the parameters are different. In this trial, they actually let people in the placebo group use topical steroids. Um, so it can, it can change things a little bit. Nemolizumab is the one that binds to the anti- it binds to IL-31, it binds to its receptor. And this is the master itch cytokine. And what we see here again is that the highest dose of nemolizumab and the second highest dose, they did extremely well in improvement uh, for patients, getting them to clear or almost clear on this score called the IgA score. So we can see more than 30% of the patients got that clear or almost clear in the um, 30 milligram group, which is pretty exciting. So there's something to be said for that. The hard part for us then, once these do come out, if and when, I hope, I hope, I hope, but the hard part for us is gonna be how are we gonna compare all these treatment options? And especially, you know, during a visit, how are we gonna, how are we gonna do this? It's almost like we need to do a one hour webinar just to talk about all the different options because I'm only talking about the biologics tonight. This doesn't even bring into all the new JAK inhibitors that are coming out. There's at least three big JAK inhibitors. Those are all gonna be pills that are gonna be taken by mouth once or twice a day let alone all the new topicals, topical JAK inhibitors, a new topical phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor, a new drug altogether called Tepinerov. So all these new things, how are we going to do it? So one thing we talked about is maybe to make this shared decision making a little more easy, we can work together to, to sort of make a, a radar plot and go over the different aspects of each medicine. And so for example, on this one, I kind of compared prednisone with mycophenolate. These are two you know, existing immunosuppressants that are out and often used in atopic dermatitis. Just to give an illustration, but we can see how fast is the efficacy? Does it work quickly? Well, boy, prednisone is pretty much as good as it gets. So the prednisone's in red, and that is, you know, pretty much as good as you get. It's so fast. Maybe I will say the JAK inhibitors, the new ones coming, they might even be a little faster, but we're talking about, you know, hours to days. Um, whereas if we compare it to mycophenolate, right? Mycophenolate is a real slow poke. It often takes several months to kick in. So I put it basically at a one, a point of one versus maybe 4.5 uh, for the onset. What about the max effect? How deep can we get people better? Well, again, prednisone, hard to beat, you know, gets people about as good as you can get. Almost the most, even the most severe patients seem to clear up. Um, mycophenolate, eh, kind of in the middle. It can help some severe patients, but I have a lot of people who say it didn't help. How about access? Can the accessibility, can they get it? Well, prednisone, fortunately, is super cheap. So even if you don't have insurance, boy, you can get prednisone. Mycophenolate's more expensive, although usually covered. Maybe some of these newer agents, though, will be super expensive. So they might be lower on this one. That, unfortunately, we love not to have to think about that. But in the real world, we do. We have to figure it. Because I write prescriptions all the time. And a patient calls and says, Doc, it's $750, you know, or it's $2,000. Or the insurance says no. I mean, that's just the reality. I wish there was some magic wand where I just say, that's the medicine you need, you know, but, and this is a real, real part of medicine that's, I think, one of the most frustrating and unfortunate. I, you have no idea how much time I spend trying to fight for medicines and find alternatives and talking to people and talking to pharmacists, sometimes all for naught. Sometimes I'll finally call the pharmacist. We've been playing phone tag all day and they're like, oh no, no, it's, it's gone through. Thanks doc. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like I spent 45 minutes on this. My staff spent several hours. There's been paperwork and letters written, and it was all for a mistake. It's crazy, but it's real. 
then we got to talk about safety. Well, look, look here. So prednisone, which sounded so golden, right, from those other things, here it takes a real hit. Prednisone is not safe at all, especially in the long term. It can cause a lot of trouble. So it gets docked a lot. And there, for example, is maybe where mycophenolate is better. And these are just kind of my my impressions on it. And then finally, the tolerability. Tolerability is important too. It's a little different than safety, right? This is like the dangerous stuff. But tolerability might even include things like stinging and burning. It's like, well, it's not dangerous, but I hate it, you know? Or with prednisone, you know, people sometimes get manic. They can't sleep. They start eating a bunch and gaining weight. It's not necessarily dangerous or a safety effect, at least in the short term, but it really affects tolerability. Or if you feel sick to your stomach on something, you know, you're not maybe going to, not going to be able to, to, to eat. You know, it's like, I'm not so sick that I can't eat. I'm not wasting away. But on the other hand, I feel crummy every day. Who wants to do that? So we're going to have to make these kinds of decisions. And I, that's why I put these medicines just as a demonstration of how this discussion might go and be something you could do with your provider and kind of go over it and think about it. So on that note, I will wrap up and I want to thank you so much for your attention and for bearing with me. And I'm excited now to open it up for questions. Dr. Leo, thanks so much for that great presentation. Uh, we have a lot of questions to get through, so let's jump right into them. Here's one. I've heard that Dupixin can be bad for your eyes. What are the side effects? And if someone has already had issues with their eyes, should they stay away from Dupixin? Yes, yeah, so it's very important, you know, to understand the kind of side effects. And I even had a patient who was crying when I brought it up. And I said, what's the matter? What are you worried about? And she said, doesn't Dupixin make you go blind? And I said, whoa, no, gosh, whoa, hold on. So she interpreted dangerous for your eyes, meaning you could lose your eyesight. And she was totally beside herself. But that is not to my knowledge, uh, uh, one of the risk factors of this medicine at all. So this is irritation, so conjunctivitis. So redness, irritation, swelling, sometimes a little bit blurred vision when their eyes are really irritated, but that's really it. So I view it as generally speaking, a tolerability issue, right? It's unpleasant, but it's not generally speaking a safety issue. Is it possible that it could be so bad you could have scarring around your eyes and the skin around your eyes? Yeah, I suppose it is, but we generally are going to stop it before it gets that point. Uh, so just think more like almost like allergic conjunctivitis, like almost like a pink eye, but it's from the medicine. So not necessarily dangerous, but still really unpleasant. And for some of my patients, a reason to stop it, but usually not a reason to not go on it. And then what about if you have prior eye issues? Well, at least I found with my group when we wrote up a we wrote up our cohort, no none of our patients who developed it had any prior eye issues and lots of my patients on dupilumab have had bad allergic conjunctivitis because we know a lot of eczema patients have hay fever and allergic rhinitis, their eyes get itchy and uncomfortable, so it's very common. Um, but at least in the group that I studied, we didn't see any predilection. So in general, I would say, even if you have eye issues, it's probably fine to try it. I do think it's worth talking to your dermatologist, talking to your allergist, and ideally maybe even an ophthalmologist at baseline, but it really is not a contraindication to getting the medicine as far as I'm concerned. I don't think it's a reason to say, nope, because you had an eye problem, you shouldn't get it. Does that make sense? Yeah, and we actually have another eye question coming up, so maybe more clarification uh, can be had here. I had success using Dupixin until I had an allergic eye reaction of ulcerative keratitis, keratitis, sorry if I'm saying that wrong, and had to stop using it immediately. Will future biologics be different enough from how Dupixin works that I might be able to try another biologic? Boy, that's like a planted question. That's like the question that I really wanted someone to ask. And that's what we we're asking the same exact question. And I was kind of alluding to that. I'm hoping that those other biologics are going to be different enough because I too have patients who I've had to stop it because the, yeah, you know, hopefully ulcerative keratitis was under control and things are fine now. We try to catch it before it gets that bad, but they had severe conjunctivitis, were very uncomfortable and we stopped it. So my hope is that it's many of them are just like you. They're eager to try another one. So when we get our next one out, hopefully, whichever one it may be, trailokinumab or lebrokizumab, I think will be the ones that are coming out next. But who knows, you know, with the FDA. Uh, but if they come out, then those patients, I actually have a list. So I'm going to say, do you want to try it? Should we see what happens? And, you know, I think some of them are brave and are going to say, yeah, I'm ready to do it. And we'll, of course, have their eye doctor involved from the very beginning and we'll watch. And then I think if we get a few patients like that, we'll be able to make an assessment and say, okay, you know what, guys, it looks like people who even had a bad eye issue on dupilumab 
they're okay on these other ones, or at least seem to be okay, right? And this is part of the tricky part. So um, we know that the incidence of conjunctivitis was a little lower in the studies for trailokinumab and lebrokizumab, but it's not zero. So it's also possible we start those people back on and within a month or two, right back. And that's one of those questions that I think we're all kind of eager to answer. Uh, here's a question about the format of biologics. Are there any biologics available in pill form? If not, why? Great, great, important question as well, because uh, people really dislike the shots, right? We were saying the shots are kind of a drag, but it turns out those molecules they're very big and they're very delicate. So you can't really get them in as a pill. If you eat them, the amylases in your saliva start to break them down. And then as soon as they hit your stomach, the acids go and you basically just ate some protein. So they do not survive in the GI tract. And even if they did, they're so big, they will not get absorbed. If your gut is even remotely normal, they're not gonna get absorbed into your body. So they'll pass right out through your stool. So that is why they need to be given as an injection. Now, is there some possibility that one day we'll have like, they have this concept of micro needles where you can actually put a medicine with these little teeny tiny needles on like a sticker and push it through the skin and maybe get it in that way? Yeah, people talk about these ideas. It's possible or plausible, but we don't really have anything functional yet. But one day maybe there'll be, you know, a dupilumab patch or something like that, a biologic patch. That'd be cool that you wouldn't actually have to feel the shots. But right now, I think for the foreseeable future, they're going to be pens or syringes. Patch sounds exciting though. Uh, next one up, you say that trelokilumab works at anti-IL-32. Where does dupilumab work? Okay, so dupilumab is anti-IL-4 and IL-13, and trilokinumab as well as lebrokizumab are anti-IL-13. So they're kind of like half of dupilumab. Dupilumab does 4 and 13, and the other two do 13 alone. But the question is, is does that have much meaning clinically? Are they going to look really different? Is dupilumab going to be better? Or, you know, one of the thoughts early on was maybe some of the side effects are cause, because of the IL-4, right? So we just, but the truth is we just don't know. From all the data we have, my honest opinion is they look very similar. They look like they're going to be quite comparable both in safety and efficacy. And I can't wait to get into the real world. Once we have some real experience with different patients, especially those who've been on one before, they'll be able to tell us the most, right? A veteran patient, that's how I learned so much to say, you know, this is feeling great. I feel just like I did on dupilumab or nah, it's not as good. You know, I feel like the dupilumab was better. So we have to, we, and we need a number of those experiences before I'll really know, because we're not going to get a head-to-head -head trial, at least in the foreseeable future, sadly. That'd be the best of all, right? If we could do a head-to-head. -head. Yeah. Here's a question about the timing of the doses of dupixent. Since dupixent is injected, injected every two weeks, is that because of the natural timeline slash life cycle of the protein breakdown that was mentioned? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the antibodies last in our body for, actually they last for quite some time. And probably once you've had your loading dose of dupilumab, it is probably still detectable even as far as 10 weeks out. So it slowly breaks down, but it's not in a linear fashion because the way our body kind of breaks down antibodies and the way the proteins hold up is kind of funny. So yeah, it just, they kind of, they experiment, they look at this this thing called the PK, the pharmacokinetics of the, of the actual antibody, and they decide, okay, this looks right. If we do it at every two week intervals, we get sort of the right steady state number for most patients. Um, there's no doubt, like if you saw that chart I showed, some people, seem to need it a little more frequently and i you know we put on there could you consider weekly dosing in some patients it was actually studied both weekly and every two weeks and then of course we know in the small weight groups it's given once a month so there's a little bit of variability to this some there's still some art left to this it's not pure science uh, here's a question about using multiple multiple biologics at once with so many types of biologics in the works, are there concerns about using different biologics together and how might they react with each other? These are very high level questions, it's great. Um, so it is an important question. I will tell you, it's so common already that I have an experience of people on multiple biologics already. So uh, generally speaking, because they're antibodies, and like we said, you have on the order of 10 
billion antibodies flowing through you all at the same time right now. You know, they're all, they just all hang out and they're all fine. So we think that sort of generally speaking, multiple biologics is okay because again, your body's just used to different antibodies doing different things at once, which is really cool. And of course, is not always the case with conventional medicines, which, you know, often rely on the liver or the kidneys to break them down and can affect other systems. So that's another cool thing about biologics, but I have many patients on combinations of biologics, sometimes for arthritis, plus dupilumab, sometimes, you know, for arthritis plus psoriasis, sometimes for sarcoid, plus, you know, so all these different conditions and cancer, bio, uh, cancer biologics too. And we really think, generally speaking, they seem to be compatible, but I will be very honest, we don't know that much about it because even though my clinic is kind of crazy, I have a lot of complex patients out in the world, very few people are on multiple biologics. So there's still a lot to learn. And here's a more general eczema question, but a very important one nonetheless. I've had an eczema for about a year and I'm still learning to manage it. How do you measure severity, mild versus moderate versus severe? Yeah, this is a, a key question and a very difficult question too, because we know that eczema waxes and wanes, right? It does this relapsing remitting format. And therefore, anytime you see somebody on a given day, it might not be representative, right? Like one of the things my patients say a lot is, I know I look good today, but I always look good right before I see you, but I've been miserable. And sometimes they hear the other other side where they say, I know I'm a mess, but it's because of X, Y, and Z, and I've been really good in the past few months. So there is a problem with figuring out severity, and there are lots and lots of different ways to measure it. There's no perfect way. I really think it is a bit of a discussion. The best way to measure it is a discussion. How are you doing overall? How are you sleeping? How is the itch? How is the impact on your life? Because kind of no matter what you look like, I mean, obviously if you look, you know, 100% bright red, oozing, crusting, bacterial infected, well, you're severe, at least right now. But some patients I see like that in two weeks, I have them way better and then they're pretty clear. So what are they? Are they severe, but now they're clear? Are they a severe pattern? Are they, how do we think about this? And I have other patients who don't look that bad, but they're miserable and I'm throwing the kitchen sink at them and I can't seem to get them feeling better. So what are they? They're mild, persistent, I don't even know. So we don't really have the right language for it. And I think a lot of times we do be, we're just more functional. We do throw patients into this moderate to severe range if they're having trouble. So even if you didn't look terrible, uh, if you're still having issues despite the basic treatment, I kind of feel like functionally you start falling into this moderate to severe group. And fortunately, we don't have to be much more precise at that point. But again, there are different tools you can do. My favorite tool that everybody could do if they want, and you can even bring it to your next dermatology appointment, it's called the POEM score, P-O-E-M, the Patient Oriented Eczema Measure. You can Google it and find the questions. It's seven questions. It takes you just a couple of minutes and you can get your score. And that actually has some, there's some cutoffs for what we might say are mild, moderate, and severe. And you could bring that with you to your visit. And you could also, after you do your treatment, whatever it is at your follow-up visit, you can bring it again and say, okay, or I got to put a plug for eczema-wise. We, we have an app through the National Eczema Association called Eczema-wise that uses a modified PO score ad, the patient-oriented score ad, which lets you do the same kind of thing. So if you can kind of track up your, track your flares and track your severity, that's a really great way. It's such a great way, but we don't even really know how to like, we don't even understand what it means yet. We're not used to seeing it, but some of my patients are now getting really good at it. They bring me their charts. So I get to see what's going on over the few months that I haven't seen them. It's pretty awesome. That is awesome. And uh, that, thanks for all that information. That was great. We have a couple questions here from current us users of Dupixent. Here's one. Dupixent has been very effective for me where I was clear for the first year. I'm two pl years plus into Dupixent and currently my only my neck and face are red and flaky where the rest of my body are clear and itch free. Is this due to my body building resistance to biologics or are there explanations on why this side effect happens in the first place? My germ suggests is I try Dupixent once a week instead of every other week. What is recommended for treating the new facial flares? Some multiple, multiple uh, things in there for you. Yes, it is it is a complex situation. So um, Vivian Shi and I, Dr. Shi, the same person that did that question, that paper about what do we do if dupilumab isn't enough, we wrote a second paper about this head and neck dermatitis. 
And this is something that we see. It seems to be about 5% of the patients. So you're in the lucky, you're not in the, <laughs> not in the unlucky 95%, you're in that lucky 5%, unfortunately, who's getting this. And that is, um, it's difficult. So some people, we actually think that it may be a yeast infection on their skin, this thing called malassezia. And we're using some anti-yeast approaches. Um, definitely ask your dermatologist if they can find that paper or find some of the current papers. Our paper is kind of a review, so we have figures and charts and stuff, and it might be a nice thing. If they can look at that paper and read it, that may help them. Typically, I have not found that going to weekly dupilumab has helped this, and in some cases, has made it worse. I don't think it's a crazy thing to try, but in my experience, has not been helpful. But the truth is, we have very little guidance here, but I would just say, if they haven't seen my paper, it might be worth reading, because we really kind of lay out everything. We review all the studies, and we have some treatment algorithm approaches that they could consider. My go-to first line, and most of my colleagues who are eczema nerds, you know, the people talking about it all day long, um, we really do try to go anti-yeast first. So that's usually where I go, but I can tell you straight away, it is not 100% effective by any stretch. And in my hands, only about one out of three. But Dr. Matt Cyrus in Ohio, he's very bullish on it. He's like, most of my patients seem to clear right up with the anti-yeast. So there may be regional differences in different, different groups. We don't fully understand what this is. Here's one that's a little similar, but uh, slightly different. So Dupixent has worked amazing for me for the last four years, but I now need to start using moisturizers and topicals again. Is my body resisting the drug? Will another biologic work with my body or will I most likely be resistant to the new drug as well? Very, very important. So it is possible, yes, over time our body does make these things called drug neutralizing antibodies and eventually a medicine can either work not as well or stop working altogether, or you can become allergic to it, that can happen. It's not guaranteed by any stretch. And I have some patients who've been on it for like six years because they were on like the earliest studies and they're still fine. Um, and I've had a couple of patients who had only been on it for a year and then felt like it didn't, didn't keep working for them. So there are probably a number of reasons that could be going on. And it's really important to work with somebody to make sure there's nothing else driving the eczema. Like, could there be an allergen in the environment that's driving it? Could you develop a new contact allergen to something? Um, really digging deep, but it is possible, as you say, yes, it is possible your body is kind of making some antibodies to it, it's not working as well. If that is the case, in theory at least, the other two biologics should be fresh and work fine because they're different enough that it really should be okay to get one of those other ones, at least in theory. But again, we definitely don't know for sure. And just so you know, you're not alone. I do have patients exactly in your position who are like, Ugh, it's not working like it used to, what should we do? Right now, I have most of those patients in a holding pattern because I'm saying, oh, I think in the next few months, we're gonna have some new options. So we'll probably switch as soon as we can and see how things go. Here's another question from a, a current Dupixent user, very specific one. A year plus into Dupixent, I experienced hives and red patches all over my body only after a long warm shower. My derm described it as aquagenic urticardia. I have never had this before until taking Dupixent. I worry this might be a permanent change due to the drug. Can biologics do that? Would this side effect go away once I stop taking the biologic? Yeah, that's um, that's disconcerting. Yeah, aquagenic urticaria is a rare kind of hives where you truly react to water. Uh, it is so rare that usually it's not that that it may actually be more heat-induced urticaria, which is much more common. So there are ways to check on that. It might be worth seeing an allergist uh, or a dermatologist who really specializes in urticaria because there can do some different testing. If it's a physical urticaria, they can help us understand. Um, but aquagenic urticaria is extremely rare, um, but possible. Uh, could a biologic do it? You know, we don't know. I think the answer is, broadly speaking, yes. You know, we are tinkering with the immune system. The immune system is acting crazy, which is why there's eczema in the first place. So we're trying to sort of settle it out and turn off some of this over inflammation. But is it possible that some other weird things can happen? I think it is, I do. And I think, you know, especially on a population scale, lots of small, you know, small little weird things can happen that maybe aren't enough to say, okay, this is likely the drug because we don't have enough people. But if we had omniscience, we could say, yeah, actually this was, the, the drug kind of triggered this in this particular patient. Because we know, you know, for example, 
some of the things we see are from a viral infection, right? So I see that the number one reason my patients come in with hives is because they are had a virus exposure, a cold virus usually, nothing big. But but do we say cold viruses cause hives? It's like, well, I mean, not usually, you know, millions and millions of cold infections happen every year. Most people don't get hives, but once in a while it does. And some of those patients, it's crazy. They get another cold the next winter and bam, the hives come back. So there's no doubt that certain things can trigger the immune system to get crazy. And it may well be, it's not the virus at all. It's your immune response to the virus that then triggers this, you know, secondary response. So I think it's possible. We are trying to modulate the immune system, which is acting crazy. So I think it is possible. And then will it last outside of it? You know, I think strictly speaking, if, if the dupilumab is directly doing it, no, then 10 weeks after you stop it, it really shouldn't be doing it anymore. But is it, again, is it possible that it sort of triggered something or, you know, a switch got flipped and, and now you are making your own antibodies to something that is triggering this that could go on and on after the dupilumab? It's possible. Yes. Just like I say, with eczema too, people say, what triggered it? What was the cause? The truth is the cause could be long gone. You know, whatever triggered it may have been a, a solitary event. And then that whole cycle gets started and now we're off to the races. So the original insult, the insult is now gone. And I think the same is true for hives sometimes too. Sometimes now the body's kind of doing it it's revved up. But that doesn't mean that's the case for you. And I think it is worth seeing somebody who knows a lot about urticaria to figure out if they can, first of all, diagnose it correctly, and second of all, give you some really good treatments. Thanks so much for that. And here's another one from a Dupixent user. Can Dupixent be used as a maintenance treatment? Because my eczema is now very controlled, I'm afraid to stop regular injection for fear of an eventual flare. Yes, we feel that of all the things that dupilumab does, that's probably its best role of all, keeping people clear over the long haul. So, you know, if somebody was absolutely miserable and not sleeping, I don't know if I'd just put them on dupilumab and say good luck because it works pretty fast, but like you don't see the maximum effect for several months. So I think it's not the best acute term treatment, but it's really good at keeping clear. So yeah, I feel comfortable keeping people on for years. My own personal approach, and this is going to vary. You talk to a different dermatologist, they might say something very different, but my personal approach is once people are doing great, and usually I like to say I like at least, you know, six months of feeling really great, really no, no flare ups ideally, or just maybe tiny flares. Then I will often discuss with them, do they want to try to come off for a while and see what happens? I don't want people to feel trapped on it. Some patients are eager to come off. They're like, yes, I don't want to be on drugs if I don't have to be. Let's go. Other patients are more reticent like you. And they say, do we have to? I like it. I feel good. And I don't want to have to worry about my skin again. And I'm actually okay if they want to stay on. I feel comfortable with it. But I like to offer it. I like to say, if you want to try, I think it's reasonable for some people to try. Now, is it possible that I could be putting people at more risk for developing antibodies to it? Yeah, it probably does. It puts them at higher risk. But personally, at this point, and I'm up for change. I'm learning new things every day. But at this point in 2021, I feel like that for many patients, at least offering it, the psychological effect of that, of just knowing that they're not chained to it if they don't want to be, is really, really empowering. People really like that. And I think it's true. And I've had patients who come off and actually do very well for months or even years. I have some people who have now been off it for a couple of years. Does it mean they're cured? No, but they're in kind of a remission state and feeling great, need very little. And I love that I've been able to watch them carefully as they come off it. And now they're basically drug-free, which is my overall goal. I don't want people on medicines, but I also have patients who are so happy on it and doing so well and had such a rough time before they don't want to tinker with it and i feel okay leaving them on it for you know for quite a long time i, I don't think we really know how long is safe but like say at least six years we have people on it maybe even longer and we have four more questions here but i'll also note for the group that we will compile the remaining questions for answering for later so the next one up is what is your opinion of tsw and dupilumab do you think dupilumab will help if the topical steroids and uh, cyclosporine do not help? Thank you. I do, I do. And I, I wrote up a paper about it actually using dupilumab for TSW. We had a very nice response. TSW, as you know, probably is super, super, super hard to treat. So I'm unsatisfied. I wish it did you know, even better, but it definitely seems to give some significant relief. And I think it's one of the tools in our toolbox. And one of the pieces that I really like about it is, as I'm saying, patients seem to be able to come off of it and not only do they not have a flare up, like a rebound flare, like we might see with prednisone, but they really stay in a remission. So I feel like it is in a cool way. It is the anti 
you know, withdrawal. It is the anti-addiction kind of medicine. It's not something you need. In other words, you know, to stay, to stay uh, clear, you can use it to cool things down. And when you come off your body is like, okay, I'm okay. And that's something that's really special about it. It's hard to say this because a lot of clinicians don't really, really understand TSW or even buy into it. They kind of still question it. So this kind of language is a little confusing, but I really think there's something to the fact that biologics are smoother than some of the things that make you spike. And I have a few questions here from uh, caregivers. Hi, my 17-year-old son who has severe eczema since he was a baby has finally gotten approved for Dupixin. I'm hesitant to give it to him because of an unknown possible long-term side effects. Are there any long-term side effects known in general as well as for adolescents specifically? Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the truth is it's not been around that long and we don't really know. And that's the truth with a lot of new medicines. Med new medicines are so exciting. We're like, yes, we can't wait. But there is that other side of the sword and that that really can be scary. My best guess, you know, in all the data that we have so far really is that they seem pretty safe for longer term use. And again, other biologic agents like for rheumatoid arthritis, people are on them for decades you know we really have quite a bit of evidence so we think that it is probably pretty safe and we don't expect there to be any long-term issues but i'd be lying if i said i'm sure you know i'm not i'm not but i feel pretty comfortable especially for my more severe patients because here's the thing the devil that i know is putting them on tons of prednisone or cyclosporin or even just tons of topical steroids or just letting the disease be miserable people say do i have to treat it it's like i guess you don't have to but it's terrible the impact on the quality of life is terrible your sleep falls apart your behavioral issues start i mean it's like so there's a real cost not treating it so that's why to me i think even for my young patients the six-year-olds you know that's approved for i feel that for the appropriate patient where we've tried those other things in earnest i never push people into stuff because a i don't think it's right but b i never want a patient to say why did you just shove this on me you just pushed i'm that's not my job. You know, my job is to be a guide. So I'm going to say, are you feeling up for it? You know, this is my, this is what I think this, I think is appropriate for you now, given all you've suffered and where you're at, but how do you feel? And that's something, you know, only you can make, but I think, I really do think everything we understand about it, all the data we have so far, it all points to it being a pretty darn safe treatment, even for the younger patients. And I actually am anticipating seeing it approved down to two year olds. That's what I think we're, it's being studied in that group. So I feel pretty good about it. Again, would I prefer no medicine? Heck yeah. You know, I don't want anyone to need these things, but compared to things like cyclosporin, methotrexate, prednisone, I think it is honestly significantly safer. And here's another question uh, about child eczema. I've had lifelong chronic atopic dermatitis, and now my four-year-old son has it worse than me. We are currently using steroids at very high strength. It will help clear, but it comes back two days later. What are options available for children? Recommendations for treatments? Yeah, that's that hurdle number two, right? Can I keep you clear safely? And it sounds like you guys are really walking the line there. You're only getting a couple of days off steroids. It's not safe to keep using them. We know we can get into all sorts of trouble. So yeah, we're going to need to to talk to somebody who's experienced with more moderate to severe disease and really go over those options. Um, you know, the dupilumab we said is only approved down to age six, but in certain situations, is it possible maybe to use it younger? Potentially. There are other treatments like light therapy. There are sometimes for my younger patients, if we're really stuck and we're using too much. We can even talk about hospitalization. I have some patients go to the Mayo Clinic where they have an inpatient or national Jewish hospital in Colorado. And they actually do inpatient. Um, so there are there are definitely lots of options, but I think the first step is getting with a specialist who really is comfortable treating and knows all the tricks because sometimes the difference between needing a systemic agent or hospitalization is really all in the treatment plan. So I use all my little secrets, be it you know everything from wet wraps to my non-steroidals to some of my natural supplements to lifestyle changes you know all these kinds of things and occasionally we can turn it around without needing to use big guns and our final question here should you go off to Pixin if you're planning to start a family Yes, you should. Um, it has not been studied in pregnant or lactating women, so we definitely don't know. All the data we have right now suggests that it is okay. They don't. They didn't see any signals for anything dangerous, but still, you don't want to be a guinea pig if you don't have to be. So typically, I have people stop it, ideally at least a few months before you start trying to conceive. Although probably, even if you got pregnant while you were on it, if you stopped it early, you know, as soon as you found out 
there probably is not enough developmental issues to worry about by the time it's out of your system. Although still, my preference is a few months off when before you start trying. Um, and there's a registry actually, so we're learning more about it. There are some patients who say, I'm not coming off because I can't, there's nothing else for me. And then they track those patients and we learn. So, you know, little by little, we'll build up a database and hopefully, fingers crossed, the conclusion will eventually be, you know, it seems pretty safe. And sometimes, you know, we may even say that may be the safest option for pregnancy because some of my severe patients, we don't know what else to do for them. And that's it for our questions here. So thanks again, Dr. Leo, for helping us get a better understanding of biologics for treating eczema. And thank you to everyone for joining us today. You can continue your eczema education on our website at nationaleczema.org. You may register for an upcoming webinar or watch the recording of a previous webinar at nationaleczema.org slash webinar dash Wednesdays. Once again, I'm Danny Morshead and behalf of the, on behalf of the National Eczema Association, thank you for joining us.